All right, thank you for staying with us. Uh, the conversation is still about the judiciary being in focus. And of course, um, <clears throat> the task ahead of my lord, the acting um, CJ and Justice Kudurat, Kekere uh, Kun. And of course, we spoke with a researcher, an impact um, you know, evaluator for his perspective about where we were on that justice and we were all retired <clears throat> and where we are right now, where we are supposed to be, you know, under uh, my lord, uh, the new acting CJ and Justice Kudurat, Kekere Kun. And uh, right now, we are being joined by a lawyer. And he's here with us, Dr. Musbao Alamu Latif. Of course, I wouldn't want to, you know, uh, regard, uh, okay, refer to him as a guest again. I think he's fully part of this program. Dr. Musbao Alamu Latif, he's a lawyer, a law lecturer at the University of Hall. He joins us from the UK virtually this morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me in again. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much. And um, we now have, um, very quickly, let's go straight to the point. We have a new uh, sheriff in town, to put it that way, talking about the judiciary, the temple of justice. The head is now Justice Kudirat Kekereakun, who has obviously has paid her due. You know, she took over from uh, the retired Justice um, Kayode Ariwola. Um, we spoke to a researcher. I don't know how much of that conversation you followed. But now you're a lawyer, and we're seeking your professional and legal angle on this. How will you describe it? Because Mr. Atiku that we spoke about talked about the perception on that Justice Ariwala and things that we need to do better, maybe some concern of some lawyers, you know, during his leadership, the leadership of Justice Ariwala, and what we need to do better now. But before we come to the present, let's look at the immediate past. How will you describe you know the judiciary on that justice Ariwala, knowing fully whether you are a lawyer so you really go to the court you follow proceedings you know what is happening and you're a law lecturer as well well um let, let me start by acknowledging that of course I, I follow your conversation with the earlier guest uh, the researcher mr atiku mm. and him being a social researcher and i i follow some of the statistics that he reeled out mm. and i must admit that they are quite damning and depressing mm. and it's quite difficult you know to fault some of them even though i may have one disagreement here and there but this yeah. is a product of scientific research i suppose and i i think the, the picture cannot really be more damning than that. So I've, having said that, I, I think it, it may not be exactly possible, and scientifically so, to use one word or even if, if a few words to, to really categorize or describe the tenor of the immediate past CJN, Honorable Justice Ariwala Rita. And I say this because uh, the, the rot in the judiciary, as Mr. Atiku has rightly captured in his data analysis, you know, it's something that is endemic, and, and I don't think it is actually easy to single out the justice system in Nigeria, you know, from the entire, I would say, corrupt system that is now the Nigerian system, if I can put it that way. Mm. So so for me, really, we, we may only want to assess Mr. Justice Ariwola, you know, from the perspective of how much of this rot, you know, has it contributed to. And I'm saying it because I don't really want to dwell on the rot again. I mean, right. this focus here, I think, is to set an agenda for the new Chief Justice. Right. And going forward from what we know, without necessarily belaboring ourselves on what has gone. So, how much of this rot has Mr. Ariwola contributed to, and how much of this has he able to, has he or was he able to redress? Well, I think the jury, you know, are still out on how to, I would say, scientifically assess and provide answers to those questions. But then I'm aware of you know the segments of the public perception you know who, who think that he has worsened the situation of things where well, i don't really agree with them 
And of course, I, I belong to the segment that think, as Shakespeare has said in one of his plays, you know, we are all actors, you know, on the stage or something like that. And we just come and play our role. And when our time is done, the curtain is drawn. And then we leave the stage for others to perform their art. So I think he has come, he has done his beats. And then, as I said earlier, how much of these beats, you know, have been able to redress the rot in the system? Or how much? So it, 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 you can attribute some, I would say, successes to the tenure of Mr. Ariwola, even though the general perception about the judiciary, you know, the perception of corruption, the perception of lack of transparency, the perception of, you know, I would say, um, arbitrariness, the perception of all of those things, unfortunately, they see persist. And then because there is really no any scientific method, as I speak now, to measure the degree, you know, of how much of this he has been able to reduce or how much he has added to them, so I may not be able to pass any specific judgment on him, other than to say, well, he has done his bit, right. he has left. We can point to a few positive things, you know, like the increment in the judicial, uh, you know, the remuneration of judicial officer and all of those things, and maybe also the increment in the number of justices, I mean, of the Supreme Court. So these are laudable achievements going forward. But you see, this achievement, they will come to nothing if the entire justice system is not reformed in such a way as to assure you know, uh, the confidence of our people in the system. Because as we say in the common saying or general parlance, uh, the justice system is the last hope of the common man. So if the common man of the, or, or the average folk on the street does not have confidence in the judiciary, no matter what reforms you undertake, you know, they may actually not come to any significant uh, impact. So that is basically, I, I, I don't know if I've actually, you know, said anything, but, but I think that is my thinking All for right. now regarding the tenure of Mr. Justice Ariwola. All so right. the jury is still out. Very Let's just well. leave it there. Very well. And, um, you know, I quite agree that, okay, um, the bulk of the conversation should be about setting a new agenda for the siege and moving on, demonstrating to our present and focusing on our future so that we have the kind of judiciary that everybody will hit their chest and be very proud of. I quite agree with that. But before we move um, entirely to that conversation, and, um, you know, some will say, by the way, my Lord, I will retired, talked about um, some of uh, the review, you know, some of the highlights, and he talked about a review, you know, uh, made by a committee headed by successor now, who is now the CGN, with some eminent personality as well, saying the previous model um, was more of from 1985, which some of those things are not consistent again with what we have right now. And he talked about the advent of ICT, telecommunications, um, impact, you know, virtual filing, some of the things he has been able to do and that the judiciary is working with right now. But let's talk about perception a bit before we move to the agenda conversation. You know, on the former Justice Tanko, many persons had issues with what happened, and majorly it was about um, giving credence to technicalities over substance of um, a particular case or a particular brief. And it happened several. In fact, at a point, the IS cases were being named, you know, colloquially by Nigerians as, um, you know, a technical a Supreme Court, a technical judiciary, which technicalities were taken, given merit, I mean, over the substantive nature of that particular um, brief or particular case. On that, Justice Ariwola, um, you know, Mr. Atiku talked about transparency and how, you know, fecal some of those things were. But as they will say, any space of human endeavor that might be margin for error as well. But, you know, the technical thing under Justice um, Tanko retired, the perception and transparency thing under, um, you know, my lord, uh, the just retired Justice Ari Wola, we, do you agree with that, with those who had that perception? Number one. Number two, is it really a case of these individuals presiding over the judiciary, or is it just the system? If you, are, if, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I can make I mean, some point out of that, I think mm -hmm. I want to start by saying 
Yes, you know, perceptions are very important, you know, in you know making decisions on how to reform a system, you know, or assess, you know, how a system has worked, and then maybe going forward and all of those. So it is actually not exactly easy or possible to dismiss those perceptions because these are what people see, these are what people feel, and all of those. But how much of these perceptions are actually real or correct is another thing entirely. And I'll give just one example. Yeah. You know, you mentioned technicality. You know, I have seen people made a number of, I would say, needless points or overemphasizing or over dramatizing this issue of technicality. And an, an average lawyer will tell you that technicality is indeed part of the law. And I give just a, 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 one straightforward an, a, a example. Now, if, if you, let's say, a, a university in Nigeria, a public university, has done a wrong to you as a student, and you wish to take them to court, for example. Now, there is a provision of the law in Nigeria which prescribes that you have to give them what we call a pre-action notice. That is, you write them beforehand, and you give them in writing three months that you, X, Y, Z, university, you have done this wrong to me, and I intend to go to court and pursue so-so and so remedies against you. That is technicality in law. The law lays down a procedure to do something. Now, it does not matter now. I will say the gravity of the error done to you or the severity of the error, if you go to court immediately without fulfilling that requirement of technicality, a court of law as a matter of duty will dismiss your case because you have not complied with the requirement of the law. Now, some people who may not have the legal understanding of how the legal process work would think that, oh, why would you just dismiss a case? Because somebody has not informed the person who wronged them. No, this is unfair. So this is also part of what we call perception. So perception, again, can be real, and they can also be unreal. They can be unreal because some people who do not really have an understanding of how things work, mm. you know, may go ahead with wrong perception. And this wrong perception may be seen as right, even though they are wrong. But having said this, I want to admit that, yes, all of these things about the ICT, even increasing the remuneration of judges or the number of judges, you know, they will amount to nothing. If the underlying issue of transparency if the underlying issue of, uh, I would say, confidence are not addressed. And I think this is where the problem really lies. So it is not the window dressing of the ICT, which are quite important as well, mm. or of or other things. So the issue of transparency, the issue of uh, having people, I mean, gaining the confidence of our people in the system, people going to court and believing that truly, justice will be served. Mm. So these, are, I think, are institutional issues, more about how we run the system, you know, than the rules, because the rules are very clear. The rules ensures transparency, or the rule prescribe transparency, if you like. The rule prescribe impartiality. The rule prescribe, you know, that people should not allow external influence. This is why judges subscribe to what we call judicial oath. So all of the rules are there. But unfortunately, there are weaknesses in the system, the justice system, such that these rules are sometimes observed in their breaches. So this, for me, really are the problem. So I, I, I cannot specifically, coming narrowing down to your specific question now, I, I cannot specifically say, you know, in the affirmative that the perception about Justice Tanko or whoever are right or correct, you know, well, they can be right, they can be correct, you know, depending on sometimes who is saying it. But generally speaking, I think we have all come to the conclusion that the system is redo with corrupt practices because you have some bad judges. And unfortunately, because we cannot possibly also, you know, remove the judicial system or the justice system from the, the entire I would say corrupt epidemic in Nigeria, I guess we just have to understand that this is a Nigerian thing, unfortunately so. And because it is a Nigerian thing, we have to focus not only on the judiciary, but even the external factors, you know, that influence the judiciary. But if the executive is corrupt, 
if the legislature is corrupt i mean if we say corruption is endemic in our system then addressing it in one segment without looking at other segments you know where the impact of corruption in those places can also you know influence the judiciary you know we amount in exercising futility so we need to generally address not only this issue of corruption in the judicial system right. but also in the entire nigerian system because this system they are symbiotic they work together you cannot really separate one from the other they are interdependent if you like so perception yes but then some of, the, some of them can be real and some of them can just be mere you right. know what people feel which may not really be in tandem without the judicial system works all right. so technicality again is part of the law right. and without technicality you know the system of justice will actually you know be in chaos all technicality right. is what mandates that people go about their seeking justice in a particular or prescribed manner so if you don't follow those te those technical requirements however good or bad your case is you know so and again sorry if i if i may emphasize on yeah. this we cannot also judge the tenor of a judge or assess the tenor of a judge or justice of the Supreme Court, whether Mr. Ariwala or whoever, based on the perception of some people who have lost cases or some people who have won cases. People who have won cases we generally want to think a judge is excellent, is perfect, and this. And people who have also lost cases, you know, naturally may also think a judge, you know, has compromised. So these are the challenges which relying only on perception to assess you know how a system works so we have to really understand that it goes beyond some of these perceptions that are usually informed by sentiment All right. that are sometimes also influenced by partisan interest people are generally not you know happy you know with the outcome of a decision and then they think the judge has corrupt turned himself or herself and all, all of those so it's a very I mean, a large canvas, I would say, to fish from. And we need to put, break down things, you know, into pieces to be able to understand how they work. All right, sir, thank you for that uh, brilliant comment. In one of your statements, you mentioned uh, external factors, uh, influence, I beg your pardon, and also corruption. So how independent of external influence do you think the judiciary was under uh, the former CJN tenure, and also regarding corruption. Uh, we also know that one of the issues affecting the judiciary is corruption. Do you think that the new CJN can tackle this menace? Well, t talking about the, <clears throat> thank you for that question too, beautiful question. Well, talking about corruption under the immediate past CJN, or independence, right? let me use your word, independence. Well, it's also, it permits me to go back to the issue of perception again, but then I want to agree that some of these perceptions are right, as I said. For example, a number of judicial appointments were made under the immediate past CJN. Some of these appointments, you know, allegedly, you know, have been, I would say, allocated to people whom some people allege again, because I've not really verified this thing, you know, are direct relatives, son, daughter, mm -hmm. or friends, and all of those. So for me, really, you know these are issues of conflict of interest if someone preside over a system and then you have to appoint your own daughter or son as alleged or people who have direct link or closeness with you no this is not to say those people are not in their own right entitled yeah. to be promoted Dr. if Martin, they have met all the requirements Dr. of Martin, marriage it, but then the important. issue of conflict of interest yeah. so if you look at it from this perspective mm. uh, if those allegations are true then we, we can begin to really understand why the system is corrupt i mean why this external influence you know may continue to assail you know effective or smooth running of our judicial system now regarding the new acting cjn mm. i'm happy that our first interview to the press after our inauguration was to also recognize this issue of lack of confidence in the system. And I recall she did say that she will, by the end of her tenure, she will, will hope that, you know, confidence will have been restored in the system. So for me, that is quite a laudable, I mean, admission or acknowledgement on the part of the acting CGN. So when the problem is recognized, even by the people who are supposed to address them, I think the problem is half solved. Now, how the new CGN will then proceed from acknowledgement to working 
to ensure confidence is yet to be seen. And this is where I think we just have to keep our eyes on the judiciary, you know, using that common uh, phrase again, and perhaps to support the new acting CJN in delivering the kind of justice system that our people deserve. I mean, a justice system where people have confidence, where impartiality, where these corrupt practices that we have mentioned. So I do not want to see the acting CGN, for example, preside over a system where our friends, our colonies, you know, as it were, you know, are faithful, you know, based on their relationship rather than marriage. Okay. I do not want to see a judicial system where judges, you know, succumb, I would say, to external influence, particularly so that we have a new era now where their remuneration has been almost over a hundred percent increase. Mm. The number of judges have been increased and all of that. I think the judiciary, you know, we have to do a house cleaning because the rules allow them to be independent. The, the rules actually prevent them against external influences. But you see, all of these things we also boil down to the personality of the judges. So if a judge has emerged through a corrupt system, somebody who has been appointed based on influence rather than marriage, you know, the successibility of that person, you know, to external influence will be very high, you know, compared to someone who has attained a position by marriage. So hopefully the, the new acting CJ who has acknowledged all of these things will go beyond the mere talk and then take step, practical step. You know, in the appointment process, for example, you know, to ensure that marriage and marriage only, as prescribed by the rule, prevail, and to also ensure that you know the justice system, you know, work efficiently in a manner to give our people confidence that when they approach the court, right. they are truly, or they are approaching a truly impartial, you know, system where justice will be served, you know, according to a, a law and due process of law. Right. And, um, you know, um, just to put these right there, um, you know, when my, um, Tommy asked about um, the external influence and, um, you know, uh, some things that people allege happened under the last administration or tenure of the last CGN as well, we heard about the appointment of some offspring of some high ranking judicial officer into some cadres. And many persons frowned at it. Uh, let me ask you, legally speaking, as a lawyer, is it an handicap thing that because your parents have high judicial officers and you, you have taken after them in their career, you are doing well for yourself and then you are worthy. You have found you, to be having the merit to be appointed into a particular position. Is it, it, wouldn't it be unfair that because their parents, um, their relatives are in a high rank, high ranking opportunity, I mean, high ranking uh, capacities, then those ones that have worked their socks off to attain that particular position should be looked down to because of public perception. Because your parents is, um, or your father, or your mother is a Supreme Court justice, so there is a vacancy to be filled and you have worked your way. And in as much now that you have been appointed, People are not frowning at it. Is it against the law, really, if those people have the merit? Okay, thank you so much for that beautiful question. My straightforward answer is that there is no any legal hand handicap whatsoever. And I've actually had to speak to this issue in other fora mm. where I echo some of the sentiment you know you have expressed now, if I can put it that way. And the point is that these people are also Nigerians in their own right. Right. They have attained, you know, the zenith of their profession or whatever it is, or they have attained excellence and all of those. So, regardless of the fact that their parents or their relatives are in this position of authority, you know, they are also entitled, to, you know, to attain to position of authority, you know, on marriage. Now, having said that, the issue about um, or the, the, what, what has caused concern for people mm. is what we call, you know, appearance of, I would say, conflict of interest or bias. Mm. Now, and this is where I think those who make those appointments, you know, they have to find a balance between allowing people to, you know, attain whatever acts they want to attain mm. based on marriage, and then 
ensuring that in doing so, the system of making them attaining those positions are as transparent, as competitive, and as impartial as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, if a chief judge, for example, will preside over the appointment of, and I'm not making any specific allegation here, yeah. if a chief judge, let's say of a state, will have to preside over the appointment of someone to become a judicial officer in the state. You see, there is that immediate you know, perception, and rightly so, that where the daughter or son of that chief judge is among the people scheduled for appointment, the likelihood of bias is automatic. Okay? So this is where the CD or whoever is making that appointment will have to go extra to display to the public and make the system so transparent and I would say impartial to the such that and competitive too, so that whoever becomes appointed at the end of the day, it will be apparent to all that this person has not emerged merely because they are related to the CD or whoever, but they have emerged from a competitive process. But what you will see in Nigeria sometimes, you know, tend to deviate from this. And this is why people have the strong perception, and I'll say rightly so, that some of these appointments are influenced by who you know than what you know or the merit that you possess. So for me, really, why there is no any legal barring against people who are sons, daughters, nieces, cousins, mm. friends, spouse, you know, people in authority from attaining the heights in their profession or whatever, right. we must find a balance, you know, between this process and then the requirement of impartiality or the avoidance of likelihood of bias because people will naturally, and I say rightly so again, All right, you know, think, yeah. you know, uh, there is a bias or somebody must have influenced something. Right. Yeah. So I, I think it is about finding a balance, balance. you know, right. between marriage and then avoidance of, I would say, uh, uh, bias and avoidance of, uh, um, you know, maybe undue uh, influence, if you like, and all of those. So all it's right. a matter of finding balance. All so right. the issue is a moral, it's more of a moral body, you know, than any legal, legal, there's no legal, legal government of law buying right. anyone. All right. But then it is more of a body, moral body. All right. You know, how would the public see this? Yeah. Would the public not really think this person has attained so, so, and so position? Because they are related to so 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 and person, right. and yet whoever is related are also entitled to live their life. Right. They are Very also well. entitled to rise to their career Very and well. become whatever they have worked hard to really become. Right. So it's you know it, it, finding that balance, right, and that. this is where system matters. Right. This is where the judicial system or institutions you know are very important. So if you have mm. very strong institutions, and I'm using the word competitive again where those positions are laid open to everyone mm. and it is made competitive mm. the recruitment process there is transparency there is accountability there is competition and all of that okay people will definitely have confidence in the system all regardless right. of whoever has emerged from the process at the end of the day very well uh dr latif uh, you know setting the agenda right now the tax um you know before uh the cgn right now and um a couple of recommendations have been made by let us seek and i just read out some of them and then you add yours as well um chief one and said there needs to be a rethinking repositioning restoration rebranding and rejigging of the uh judiciary uh shashore san you know said she should release state judicature you know, just the way he, he put it. Let me take that again. She should release state judicature from the shackles of central control, whatever that means. Maybe I want to help us with that. Allegi SAN says, the principle of judicial precedent must be respected. A situation where cases on the same set of facts result, result in different outcomes is a dangerous trend. And we saw that happened, you know, under the last um, tenure of um, in the judiciary, under the tenure of Justice Ariwala, Idigbe Hesian said she must be courageous to resist skeptics and defend against internal and external pressures. And Yadudu said she should ensure that bad eggs in the judiciary are not treated with levity or a mere backslap. 
These are recommendations from very senior lawyers and learners say you agree completely with them and what will be your own addition as well? Well, I agree with them absolutely. And I think these are quite um, important things. The new action CJN, you know, we truly have to focus on. But you see, the irony here is this. All of these respected persons you have mentioned, and I mean respected persons, uh, and this is not casting any aspersion, yeah. they are truly respected, but they are, they are also part of the system and they are part of those some have also accused at one time of the or the other you know of being responsible in quotes you know for some of these rot in the sea and i give just an example yeah these personages that you have mentioned they are all learners sick and we do respect to them these are people whose cases you know are dealt with you know expeditiously when they approach the courts and sometimes rightly so too but people have also said okay some of the challenges in the judicial system is that some people they get their case hard, you know, so quickly that you wonder how they do it, whether they have not really. So what I'm saying is this: if a junior lawyer, for example, file a case at the court of appeal today, court of appeal, the closest to you is the one in Akure, you know, that case may be in that court. I tell you, for almost two, three years, without even being listed for hearing. But some of these persons that you have listed or mentioned, when they file similar cases, the case get hard the second day, sometime within one week and all of those. So these are part of the challenges you have in the system. So you see, Nigeria will like talking and talking and talking, and everybody can summarize, everybody can pontificate. But when it comes to action, mm -hmm. everybody know what they do behind the scene. So my urge is this, and I'm happy the acting CJ actually said that. In a you know opening remark, we actually said, look, I can't do this alone. This has to be a collaborative work. People will have to work to me. So work to me rather. So for me, some of these you know respected personages that you have mentioned, I hope some of them will also collaborate you know with the new action CJN in ensuring that our judicial system is reworked, as they put it, is rejig, as they put it, is reshaped, as they put it. Or even the entire judicata, you know, as one of them has put it, is revamp. Whatever it is, it is going to be a collaborative work with all of this very big personality also coming on board, you know, perhaps to ensure, you know, impartiality, to ensure the smooth running of the system, such that a young lawyer will have confidence that when he files a case before a judge, the case will go through a normal process and will take the same time as a case of a senior advocate. Not that a, senior, a junior lawyer will file a case in court today. The case will be on the docket for a month, for weeks, mm -hmm. without being listed for hearing. And a senior advocate will walk to court, you know, file a case after that junior, junior lawyer, and that case will get hard. How do they do that? And I can tell you, as somebody who has practiced at least for 15 years myself, mm. that the system does not actually permit such impartiality. The system allows that when a son appear in court, you have to listen to them first, fine. But then the system does not say that when a son file a case, his case, regardless of when he file it, it can be had the second day, the third day, the fifth day. Or when a junior file a case, the case will remain on the docket without being listed for hearing. So these are kind of the system you know, so when we talk about the rot in the system, like I yeah. said earlier, it's an endemic thing, which, you know, covers, you know, uh, it, it extends to the bar, not only the bench. Mm. So the big personages at the bar would like to dish out some of these recommendations. I want to encourage them, and including myself too. I mean, uh, I, I, this is my 15, 16 years at the bar. So all of us, we need to work together, you know, to ensure that we do the right thing so that the system can work better for all. All right. Thank you, Doctor. All right. So, uh, the Nigerian Bar Association, the NBA, kicked off its uh, 2024 annual general conference on Friday, August 23rd, 2024. Uh, the conference will be ending on Wednesday, 28th, uh, August 2024. Am I right, sir? Yeah, you're right. You're right. All That's right, so one program I think I'm missing right now. Yeah. I should be there as well. All right. Let's talk about the Nigeria Law School, which is considered to be the incubator of most of these practitioners. So what areas would you advocate for further improvement? Um, so as to ensure the nation gets the best out of legal practitioners in the country?
Well, it, it, let me first and foremost, you know, congratulate the Nigerian bar. You know, this is a conference. I think this will be the 58th or 59, if I'm not wrong. Um, the MBA has come a long way, and this annual conference, you know, is one of those events where the lawyers in Nigeria come together, you know, to, I would say, um, discuss issues around the entire country and then the legal system and all of that. Wow. So for me, really, I think this is another opportunity, you know, to rethink our legal system in Nigeria, um, particularly the aspect regarding training of lawyers. Now, uh, some people have argued that perhaps we should make law a second degree, such that people will call, because this day, and I've seen that as a law teacher myself, I, I taught in Nigeria for almost a decade at OAU, and then I teach here as well. So I, I, I've interacted with new lawyers, new weeks. So and without some um, prejudice to them, I, I think we now have, you know, many more in quote, immature persons, you know, coming to the bar to practice law. So, and, and, and I think that's one aspect, you know, we really have to look into whether, as they do in other jurisdictions, All right. particularly in the U.S. and mm -hmm. Canada, law should be made a second degree so that whoever is coming to study law will have had a prior degree, maybe in philosophy, science, or even whatever, mm -hmm. perhaps to develop their intellect much more then they will just come straight to study law. Some people have said that. Some people have also said that, okay, why do we have to study law for five years? When in the UK, you study the same law undergraduate for just three years. So that we inherited these five years or so from the UK, and then we are stuck at it. We are not. Right, so doctor, these are the kind of things I think have to should go. dominate conversation right. at the back conference so right. that people can put forward well nuanced positions on some of these issues and then we can find a way forward All another right. one is about remuneration of young lawyers mm -hmm. young lawyers are miserably paid in nigeria young lawyers are poorly paid in nigeria and some of the coming back to some of the issue i mentioned earlier you know unfortunately some of the people who pay lawyer very poorly you know and i say this with all sense of modesty as some of the big lawyers you see on tv you know, they argue about human rights, they argue about labor rights and all of that. All but right. when you go to their law firm, they don't Doctor, pay their junior I'm lawyers well. We the they pay them pittances. Mm. These people earn in millions, you know, from big, big briefs. Yeah. We're not begrudging them for this. All they right. have earned their position, they have earned their reputation and all of that. All right. But we think it would be the best for the system mm. for them to also extend, I would say, you know, kindness to young right. lawyers who work under them. All right. So that lawyers are well remunerated, they are well paid. All right. You know, a lawyer, a new week deserve, I would say, decent living yeah. or decent wage. So yeah. these are some of the things All right. I think the mm. MBA at this time, you know, should, should you know, be concerned with. All right. So that the future of legal practice, the future of lawyers, and all of this issue of corruption and all of that, all right. you know, would also, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, be, be, I mean, be, be better and all of those. All right. So that, that's Thank what you, I Dr. think, Hattie. and I think, or hope, yeah. you know, the conference yeah. is going to be a success, all you right. know, like we've had in the in the past. All Thank right. You, Thank sir. you, uh, Dr. Misbah Latif, a lawyer, law lecturer, the University of Hall. We well, thank you for your time, and um, obviously. The question that Tomilola asked about uh, the quality of people that will produce the quality of liars that you have just started. We should have that conversation in the coming days because it is a lot. And you just talked about the culpability of some members of the bench, you know, in this same judiciary um, conversation that we are having, not just pontificating and, you know, uh, uh, pointing accusing fingers at the bench, you know, uh, yeah. the bar as well has a role to play. We will have that conversation. I want to sincerely thank you for sure. your time this morning. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. You thank too, you, sir. sir. And you too, Tommy Lola, we should go. Yes, we should. Mm. And of course, uh, this is where we put the brakes uh, right now. Femi Joyce Mane, please, you can have a recap of this program on our YouTube channel at Western Spring Television. Do have a very lovely day. And I am Tommy Lola Daniel. Join us tomorrow for another insightful edition. Bye for now.